On this episode, we sit down with noted film director Paul Spurrier. So if you want the inside scoop on what it's like making films in Thailand in Thai language as a foreigner, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. And welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 to escape the totalitarian regime of the Maple Emperor and liked the sugar-free beaches so much that I just decided to stay. Okay, that is not true, but creative anyway. You don't know. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract almost 22 years ago, fell in love with people telling me my ties should really be better given how long I've been living here, so I never left. It took it as a challenge, eh? <laughs> you know, I just like it. And it, it never ends. And it, it becomes more divergent, you know, because the, right, the longer yeah. I'm here, the, the longer I'm here, the gap between my tie and how long I've been here gets bigger. You're just gonna, you're just gonna like stay here longer, make your tie get worse just to spite the people that comment on <laughs> That's it. That's right. It's so much fun, you know, hearing this over and over again. <laughs> we want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our ad-free regular show a day early emails with behind the scenes photos of our interviews, access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world, and various other goodies. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about a fun night out that saw myself, Greg, and a few other friends get back into the business of enjoying Bangkok. A call out by friend of the show, Stu J. Raj, on his YouTube channel, which examined the quality, in quotation marks, of my Thai language skills. And some thoughts on the insane graduation ceremony at my university, which was twice as large as normal due to last year's ceremony being canceled. To learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. Right on. And as always, if you have something interesting to say or a show idea or a joke or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we will play on the show. No doubt. All right. Well, on this episode, we welcome one of Thailand's best known film directors, certainly one of its best known Farang film directors. And we are, of course, talking about Paul Spurrier. Now, Paul has been around film his whole life, first as a child actor in the UK, then working behind the scenes with film technology, and finally as a director. Some of his films are the Thai ghost movie P, The Forest, Eulenia, and The Maestro. He's also been the director of photography on the television series Naksu Nok Sang Wian and the historical drama The Edge of Empire. And he's also the head honcho at the awesome Freeze Green Club, a members-only film club just off of Sukhumvit Road that I am not a member of, but I think you are, right, Ed? I sure am. Yeah, it's a great place. All right, so Ed sat down with Paul to chat about all things film in Thailand. So here is the conversation between Ed and Paul Spurrier. Okay, I'm sitting here um, on the second floor of the Freeze Green Club in central Bangkok. Uh, I'm with Mr. Paul Spurrier, who is a British expat in Thailand, who uh, uh, he writes films, he produces films, he directs films, he's an actor, but his uh, specialty, or I think maybe unique trait, is that he's actually making movies uh, mostly in uh, Thai language. So first thing I wanna do is welcome Paul Spurrier to the Bangkok podcast. Hello. (laughs) Hello. Uh, Paul and I have known each other for years. He is the proprietor of a film club, uh, which we are at right now here in Bangkok, which we'll tell you about later. Um, I wanted to kind of begin at the beginning because uh, I remember when I first met you, Paul, you had all kinds of pictures and film memorabilia on the wall. And at some point I realized that you actually were an actor as a child back home in, in Britain. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, I was a, uh, I was born and brought up in a small town in the east of England, Lowestoft, uh, which uh, there's absolutely no reason why you should ever have heard of it. It was, a, <laughs> it was the most easterly point in England. Was, oh, really? 
It was a windy, rainy, <laughs> desolate sort of place <laughs> that uh, one could never imagine anything creative coming out of. Um, but I always, uh, I, I distinctly remember the first film that I saw at the cinema. My grandmother took me to see The Sound of Music. Really? That's the very first one? The very first film I saw at the cinema. And it was back when the screens were big. Right. You know, now they then afterwards they sort of chop them up into little bits. Sure. But, uh, but and for me, I, I don't know how old I was. I was probably about seven or eight. And it was a most profound experience. The, the massive size of the screen, this, this, the scenery from the opening shot and everything. And, and when I got home, it was my grandmother had taken me, and my parents were quite disturbed because I was sort of crying kind of hysterically. <laughs> and they thought I must have been abused or something. So what on earth is wrong? And I just said, you know, oh, they got away at the end. And there were sort of tears of just overwhelming sort of relief that they'd got away. And I, I went to bed, and in the morning, I had cried so much, my eyes were stuck together, and uh, my, my mother had to sort of take some sort of uh, water and open up my eyes. You were so affected by the sound of music. Exactly. And so I think that was the moment where I, I really wanted, because I knew nothing about how a film worked, how something could happen, whether, you know, I didn't even realize probably what actors were. And so... I think, in a way, that was the moment where I realized that I wanted to, in some way, be involved in this magical experience. Well, this is fascinating because uh, when I came in here today uh, and you called me upstairs, uh, you, of course, were editing some music for a musical. So apparently that was the formative event of your life. You're still, <laughs> you're, you're st you're still living uh, the sound of music in one way or another. So, so at that point, you hadn't acted. Or no, you, not at all. Um, and then... You know, shortly after, um, I I managed. To, there was an advert in the, uh, in the I think the Times, an agent who said they were looking for young talent, and uh, and, and so I sent off a, a message, um, saying you know could I could I audition and uh, join the agency and uh, got a letter back saying yes. And then I had to tell my parents and ask them to take me to London, uh, which they did. And I and the agent had no people on their books at all. I mean, it was a startup agency with no oh, really? no, no uh, pedigree whatsoever. But that did sort of launch a, I mean, a, a sort of mini career as a as an actor. Um, up until I, I suppose about the age of eighteen, nineteen was when I sort of gave it up. But I it took me to many countries in the world. There were films, television, stage plays. The it was, uh, I mean, look a lot. There were only ever sort of three sort of newspaper or magazine articles, aren't there, about ex-child actors. <laughs> you know, they're either sort of, it's look what happened, it wrecked their lives, and right. they're, they're right. sort of drug addicted and on a street somewhere, <laughs> right. washed up with tattoos all over them, sort of like Bangkok. <laughs> or, you know, or... Um, you know, or they faded into obscurity. And right, they, where is he now? Kind of thing. Yes, yes. Or they sort of sue their parents because they never <laughs> wanted to do it and they're trying to get their money. Right. And so my story is, I don't know, maybe a combination of all three. But, uh, <laughs> but I, unlike all of those, I, I, didn't, I don't regret a moment of it. I mean, those were very happy and exciting days to be... I'm sure. To be out, you know... Well, to be working. I mean, it made going back to school very hard. I'm sure. I it, can't imagine um, really doing this mostly on your own initiative. You didn't, you didn't come from a, a family of drama people or anything like that. Is that correct? No. I mean, my mother had been a ballet dancer many years before. But my father, um, I think his only experience on the stage was once he played the... Uh, the back end of the pantomime horse in the company show. <laughs> so, I mean, no, it was not a, a theatrical background. I mean, look, and I've never known, I'm sure my father would have been sort of in some ways happier had I got my nose on the books and become a lawyer or a doctor, as, right. as, as good children are expected to do. But um, so, yes, no, it did largely come, I don't know from my initiative, but just from this incredible satisfaction of... Oh, uh, that's great. Um, 
if you don't mind me asking, what, what's probably the, the, the most well-known film you, you, you had a role in? Well, I think uh, somebody reminded me the other day of The Wild Geese, which was a film that was uh, quite popular in England, still played every year with Richard Burton, Richard Harris, and Roger Moore. Oh, that's incredible. And one of the cast died the other day. I can't remember who. And, and I realized I, maybe <laughs> there were only a couple of us left. Hardy Kruger died. I, I'm one of the sole surviving members of that. And you played, you played film. someone's son, presumably. I played Richard Harris's uh, son, yes. Oh, that's great. So you actually had experience with these quite famous, prominent actors. Yes. I mean... I don't think I really could appreciate who they were at the time. Sure. Um, they were just people who you, know, you acted with. And it's only in later years when you look at the work of these people and think, wow, I, I wish I'd known them what I do now and the questions I could have asked these people and things I could have learned. But, sure, uh, sure. So you have all this experience as an actor. So how did you transition to wanting to actually make productions or write or produce or direct? Well, I had always... Um, I mean, one of the first things I bought with the money from acting was a Super 8 uh, camera. Oh, wow. Okay. And I used to take that. I had an ongoing, <laughs> totally never finished um, documentary epic I was making, which was called Filming Filming, which is my oh, really? very clever <laughs> pun of a title at 10 years old, which <laughs> the idea was to sort of shoot the behind the scenes of how things sure. were made. And uh, the very weird thing was only a few years ago, there was a British documentary, TV documentary, about a series I was in called Tales of the Unexpected. And they got in touch with me and asked if I had any sort of recollections, because uh, I was in a, an episode which was one of the more expensive ones. And I said, well, not only do I have recollections, but I've got some Super 8 footage of the behind the scenes. Oh, wow. So you still have all this footage. And I have found it out and it was the telly scene and they broadcast it. So that was another weird feeling to think that something I had shot age 10, you know, 40 years ago was actually wow. finally being, my, so, my documentary was finally <laughs> released 40 Wait, so years do, you, later. do you have all of that footage? you have all the Super 8 you shot? Um, uh, oh, God. Well, I mean, you know. I have stuff everywhere. The problem is, that I probably got it. The problem is, you know, is always finding this somewhere. <laughs> that would be um, a project, uh, 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 you know, just to retrieve all of that and go back and, and, and watch it. Yeah. Um, but, so yes, I was always, I loved, you know, I, I enjoyed acting, certainly, but what I loved was the process of seeing how a film was made. Right. Um, occasionally, I would, uh, if I was in a lot of scenes, they'd give me a stand-in, and they'd say, "You can go to your dressing room now." And I'd, I'd almost always, I'd say, "No, it's okay. I'll stay here," because I love just seeing how they put up the lights and what they're doing, and where did they hide the microphone? And wow, that's a great education. I mean, so, so it sounds like your education was mostly not in school; it was on set. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and look, I mean, the life of a working actor, there's, I can think of no better job. You know, you, you're you playing the whole sure. time. Sure. Um, the problem is that the statistic used to be that 80% of British actors were unemployed at any time. Right. And I think that's probably got worse. Hmm. Um, I think so many more people than ever before consider these sort of careers, which maybe before would have just seemed too strange, too outlandish. So now we've got more and more theater schools, more and more drama schools. I see. Convincing people to be, to be actors or even filmmakers. And the problem with being an unemployed actor is, well, you have no real control over your destiny. Hmm. Um, okay, you can maybe try and you know perform a one-man play or find friends to do something, but most of the time is you're sitting around waiting for the phone to ring on the off chance that somebody has a role that you might be right, right for, that they might recognize your talent and might cast you in. Sure. So in that sense, it's, 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 to be an unemployed actor is the worst job in the right, world. Right, 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 um, right. So 
I think that at some point, you know, when I stopped being a sort of small, cute boy who could play school children and they got sort of acne and strange and gangly and, and, and <laughs> then it rather than sort of start again because I think that's what you have to do there are so many child actors who didn't make it as right. look, look at Macaulay Culkin right you have to remake yourself as, you a, ha- as an you adult you have to try and some people have done that quite well some people have managed to reinvent themselves I, I thought it was probably you know that was fun I did that now let's try <laughs> behind the camera gotcha gotcha so by university you were you hadn't given up acting but you were more maybe more focusing on the filmmaking angle. yes yes without a doubt gotcha so uh how did you end up so i understand everything so far but then um how did you end up in thailand what was your first connection to to this country well we're jumping forward quite a few years i mean i had always had a very I, I went in the end to the London Film School. Oh, okay. And the London Film School had basically one one overriding philosophy, which was that if you went there, you should learn to be able to do just about any job on the set. Uh, you were discouraged from specialising to. Uh, early. Interesting, interesting. So we had to learn. And it was quite a technical course. It was really a technical college. So you had to learn, you know, the, the, the practicalities of light and how it worked and how to measure it and how to use lights to create light. There was I mean, soft light and hard light. You had to learn how to edit on film and cut and use tape. You had to, and how to sound edit. Anyway, the whole gamut of all the different skills. And, and I actually loved that again and i i always felt and still do think that to really be i don't know a, a versatile filmmaker that if you the more aspects of the process that you understand the more in control you are i suspect maybe i'm wrong but i suspect that you know the old guys the the scorsese the spielberg i'm sure uh, george lucas I bet that if you sat them at an editing room, they could edit themselves or they could put up the lights. Sure. I think they were masters of that process in a way that perhaps isn't anymore. Um, So, look, I had a strange sort of early career in that I did so many different things. Um, I edited, I shot as a cameraman, I wrote, I directed, I did some producing. My career was all over the place. But But you stayed in England. Oh, yes. And I I had a company and we made anything that anybody wanted us to make. We made uh, commercials, uh, music videos. Uh, we had clients who were uh, computer. Uh, we had IBM, Intel, 3Com, Cisco. Oh, wow. We made videos for Blockbuster Video, if you remember that. We did sure. the in-store channel. Oh, wow. And we were incredibly busy. Um, and at some point, I kind of lost my, I don't know what it was, um, my energy, my, enth- my passion, if you like. And it seemed like the industry had changed. It seemed like it was no longer about uh, the fun and joy of creativity. It seemed like it was now all run by a sort of accountants. I see. All the sort of the, all the talented old drunks who had forever inhabited the British film industry had been put out to pasture. And now it was (laughs) sharp young men and women who, you know, took cocaine and did deals at (laughs) breakfast in the Groucho Club. Yuppies and business people. Uh, Yeah, and I I, I really started to resent that. Uh, Nevertheless, I carried on. And, um, And then a friend of mine rang me up to say, would I go to, uh, to Thailand uh, for Christmas 1999 and help him shoot a documentary about elephants? It was what he needed was a little dramatized section. And I said no, because I uh, was uh, no real interest in going to Thailand. It seemed like a place full of sort of weird uh, cannabis smoking backpackers. And, that was uh, probably accurate. <laughs> And I was due in any case to go to America with my girlfriend. So he rang me up two or three times and I refused every time until I then broke up with that girlfriend. And about an hour after we broke up and said, no, 
way was she going to America with me? He rang and said, so you're sure you're not free to come to Thailand? And I said, <laughs> yeah, I'm free. Take me to Thailand. As a matter of fact, I'm free now. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I mean, so that was the extraordinary thing. I, I knew nothing about Thailand. I'd only have had one Thai meal in my life. I couldn't have found it on a map. Um, and the moment that I came here, I found it... It was so odd to for me to have come from, you know, Christmas in London, uh, pre-Christmas, and then we're up in Lampang in a jungle filming elephants with a Thai lighting crew and dollies wow. and, right. uh, and local people playing the stories of this, you know, the Mahouts. And, and it was, this is insane, but, uh, but great. And the scenery and the story and uh, the whole thing really was utterly inspiring and i think right then and there i thought look this seems like an inspiring place to to make a film and i want to come back and and make a film interesting so you you more or less fa fell in love with the place straight away oh yes 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 very 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 quickly and i remember i don't i was with this sort of very uh, experienced um, BBC crew who were very used to doing these sort of things. And so they were very professional and we had arrived at the hotel. And, right, we have to be up at uh, six in the morning or better go to bed. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to bed. <laughs> I, mean, I want to go out and explore. I'm in Thailand. I'm in Thailand, right. So I remember I went down and I spoke not a word of Thai and the guy could speak no English, but I managed to sort of, you know, make hand movements and gyrate enough for him to realize that I wanted to go and find a drink and find right. some nightlife. And so I went off and, and every night during that shoot, the crew was all tired, better go to bed. And I had to go off and be and <laughs> living an it up until three, four in the morning for stumbling back to my room to get out to work. That's great. And it was only on the very last night that uh, that the crew decided we should all go out and, and, and see what was in the town. And of course, I got caught out because everywhere he went, it was uh, people oh, saying, Mr. Paul, Paul, you're here again, you're <laughs> usual. Paul, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, that's great. I love these early expat stories. Obviously, this podcast is just designed around the the expat experience, and and uh, you know all of us are hooked. I, I was hooked very quickly, like after getting here. It was to me, it was the right mix of the exotic and the familiar. You know, if something is just all exotic, it's overwhelming. But you know, here you can have this exotic experience and then go to McDonald's. Well, I think at the end of that trip. I took a side trip to uh, Phnom Penh. I thought if you're out there, then really go and see the sure. place. And I think that for me was an example at the time of somewhere that was certainly exotic, but not uh, comfortable I at see. all. Right. Uh, you so know, when was... you hear gunshots in the night and... It, it's too far out there, right. For me, at that point, I thought, you know, yeah, that that's my limit. <laughs> I've been since and love it, but it's changed a lot. Right. So I presume you ha had to go back home, but you, you had a plan to come back to Thailand. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and so I started to come back really quite regularly. Um in between jobs, I would get on a plane and come for a week, 10 days, you know, maybe three times a year, even three or four times a year for about three years. And during that time, I would take about four hours of Thai classes each day. And that was something I realized I had to do very early on. Um, and at the same, then I would make trips up to Isan and try and, uh, and research stories and learn the geography. So it was great to have a, a mission to, uh, to sort of shape my visits. What did your, I'm just curious, what did your, your parents or your, your friends in, in the business back home think about this whole Thailand adventure? Oh, I mean, I think they thought it was, you know, either a sort of, early midlife crisis or a sort of late form of teenage rebellion, <laughs> one or the other. Um, I mean, I think people, when I eventually made the decision to basically sort of wind down the company in England and move to Thailand, I think a lot of people uh, thought I'd, you know, gone a bit mad right right because i you know the, the company had business and was was uh, turning over and uh and yet i mean i've never regretted that for for a second 
Right, right, right. Um, Fascinating, man. Once you make that choice and and you leap in a hundred percent, it it really your life has to- becomes something totally different. Yes, and of course, I mean, I I don't know what how people who you left behind have have reacted because that, that's a mixture of reactions as well. You know, some years down the line, you find some people. Uh, in a way, I sort of admire you more um, and maybe even think, you know, that maybe their life could right. have been more exciting. Right. You even get sometimes a sort of strange form of of jealousy, it's almost like you've cheated the system. <laughs> you, <laughs> right, right, right. You didn't do the thing where you didn't get a mortgage and have a wife and two children and a suburban house and a right. and an electric car and wait for your pension. And, and <laughs> how is that possible? How did you manage to avoid that? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there is a there is this feeling of expats that we are on some kind of adventure. And I, you know, and it, I, sometimes when I'm back home, I, I think people do react to me in a way that they think I'm doing something special. I mean, sometimes I feel that way. And it is, I guess, special in in some way, just a little out of the ordinary, something unusual, right? Well, and of course, there's always this idea that you must be some sort of, you know, rampant sex pervert. <laughs> right, because right. that's clearly the only thing that anybody there knows There must be something wrong Thailand. with you, right? <laughs> there must be something wrong with you if, <laughs> yes, yes. if you live in Thailand. Uh, so anyway, so you started, you restarted your career here and uh, of course, there's many movies uh, shot in Thailand. This is a a production hub uh, for all kinds of movies. But most uh, you must have been speaking to the Thai government. A hub, <laughs> a, it's hub a that's production right. hub. <laughs> that's right. Um, but typically, when foreigners come here, uh, they come here and they make Western films or they make movies in English, and they're taking advantage of cheap labor or Thai crews. Um, but you've made uh, several films here, which are. Uh, predominantly or mostly uh, in Thai. That, is that that's correct? Yes. Um, so how, I, I'm fascinated by that choice. What, what what led to that? It's a good question. I, uh, why did I? I suppose it it felt like part of the adventure and the challenge. Um. I really never had any desire to tell, you know, the story of the the Western guy who comes to Thailand and uh, either see. gets involved in drugs or meets a bar girl or, right. you know, the, the, all these stories that we feel we've seen and heard so many times. Right. And it seemed to me that was kind of missing the point of being in Thailand. It struck me that what interested me was... Um, the things that weren't in England. I, I suppose that's why that was attracted to me, why a few of my, or two of them anyway, have been sort of based on Thai ghost stories. Right, right. I think it struck me, there, there were weird things that uh, that I rather, that surprised me during those trips around Isan. Like I remember driving around a curve in a road and the guy beeping his horn and I would say, why did you beep your horn? Was that in case somebody else was coming around the corner? And he said, oh, no, because there have been lots of accidents. And you beep your horn to scare away the, the ghosts that might be oh, there. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> and you realize that, you know, the spirit houses, the, the, the ghosts that inhabit the fields and the banana plants, this isn't some uh, something exotic. It, it, it's very much part of... Uh, at least a rural and even to a certain extent an urban culture. Right. And so for somebody who's interested in making films, um, that's kind of exciting. If uh. you make a ghost film in England, you're you're immediately in in a weird area. You're it's right, something that no we don't believe in anymore. But in yeah. Thailand you're sort of preaching to the converted already. Right, right, right. So that interested me. Also, I mean well, one of the things I always find interesting, I don't know about you, but quite often when I'm with um, other expats, a certain percentage of our conversation is always about little odd traits and or little odd aspects of Thailand. That's the entire Bangkok podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think for some of us, we never stop being 
um, surprised and confused and That's amazed right. yes. and intrigued by this country. Yes. And I don't know whether uh, whether Thai people are sort of <laughs> obsessed with, with us as we are about them. I think not. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, that sort of also fueled um, part of what I wanted to make about films, about exploring the the weird politics of of a village and the the weird class system of um, of how people interact and the hierarchies and how important that is. Um, okay, so I understand all of that. You're you're really absorbing the local culture, and you want to make a story relevant to the local culture. But I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate here just from a, a business or marketing standpoint. Why not make that story, but have it in English? And then you're, you're going to have this bigger market of people who can maybe watch the film. Why go to the trouble of, of, of doing the whole thing in Thai? Oh, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and I've largely failed in, in two areas. <laughs> I mean, the first area is that you know i make thai films that generally don't find a very large thai audience <laughs> <laughs> so to a certain extent uh you know the, the idea of a westerner making thai films is not one that drags uh, thai audiences in um the other thing is clearly uh you're absolutely right why who how many sort of people in Oregon go out to the cinema on a Saturday night right. and say, I know, let's go and see that Thai film. Right, 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 right. So, I, I mean, yes, it's a hopeless uh, idea. Um, and yet, look, I've always been both lucky and, and cursed as a filmmaker in the, because I make films relatively, no, incredibly cheaply. Right. Um, I've never had to deal with these sort of boring truths that you mentioned that needs to make money and find an audience. Right, right, right. Um, so, yes, I mean, if there were, you know, uh, producers and executive producers who actually thought they might want their investment back, I couldn't have done anything that I've done. But it seems to me that that if you have... If you if you found the freedom to 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 express yourself and make a film, it would be horribly squandered if I chose to make something that was sort of easy, like everybody else is doing. Right now, you know, in a way, now that I think about it, maybe it would have been really weird. You know, it, it, like certainly Thai people wouldn't have been interested in, in a film set in an Isan village if everyone was speaking English. Like you know, that that would be thoroughly rejected. It would be so odd for them to hear like actors speaking English. Um, and uh, so maybe if to tell the stories you want to tell in those settings, maybe you have to do it in the native language. I mean, it, it, maybe, uh, you know, so maybe it's, maybe English really wasn't a true option. Um, I, I felt not. Um, you know, although I, you mentioned earlier, the current sort of project I'm obsessing about is a musical. Right, right. And there I really want to trade on this weirdness, because this is all set in Isan. Ah, okay. And I want it all to be in the natural language of Isan or Thai. Right. And yet, every 10 minutes or so, they break into an English Hollywood uh, musical number. Oh, that's great. And so, you know, that's an area where I think, if it's going to be weird, let's make it all out sort of fantasy oh. weird. So oh. the farmers all start singing in uh, in English. I love it. You know, <laughs> you know I, I mean... I'm a fan of yours for many reasons, but uh, I, just the fact that you're really doing your own thing. I mean, like you said, you're you're really kind of off the radar of the normal industry. You're not answering to at least too many investors. You're you're you of course uh, are trying to make a living, but uh, you've got your own little. Trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got your own you've got your own niche where r really, I uh, I mean, like you, I know tons of filmmakers uh, in Thailand or ton tons of people in the business. Um, uh, but but typically they're serving Western studios one way or the other, like you know it, you know to yeah. you know supporting what Western studios are doing, and uh, well, but look, uh, but at least you have your you're really kind of doing your own thing. There are there is a lot of sort of creativity out there. Uh, there were there were writers in Thailand. There are artists, uh, both Thai and expat, of course. 
And of course, when you write the novel you've always wanted to written or, or, or spend your time painting the countryside or whatever, the, the, the most likely outcome is that your work will never be seen or read or sold and will fade into total obscurity. <laughs> and, and yet, I don't think that's a reason not to do it. And I think I've got more comfortable with that as I've got older, which is to realize that, that one shouldn't be overly affected by the idea that you might get to walk a red carpet and, uh, sure. and, and hold some gold statue. Sure. But really, the only possible reason for doing something, if you really want to do it, is to just have it to get it done. Right, right. Well, I certainly support that. Uh, I, I love it. You know, I, I really enjoy your films. I mean, just when, when I, it is true that when I watch your films, I feel like uh, this is something I haven't seen before. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to go through all your movies, but uh, I will, for our listeners, I will have links below so they can read about your films and, and hopefully watch your films. Um, I do have a couple more questions for you. Uh, we, we have had other filmmakers on the podcast, and there is this kind of ongoing recurring topic which i wanted to ask you about and this is kind of the topic of when you're writing or i know you've done some script doctoring um do do you feel that there really is a big difference between a thai audience and a western audience when you're looking at a script either yours or someone else's are you saying okay this won't play in thailand or we have to change this you know you know we you and i have mutual friends who've written comedies or ghost movies and Mm. and i I love this topic of like, oh, we this story will not work in America, but Thai people would love it. Is this is this a dichotomy, or, or or do you feel like, hey, I'm just doing something universal. I'm I'm just making a human story that anyone can relate to. Where do you, how do you think about this? Well, I do think there are some fundamental differences in maybe what we have traditionally seen as a narrative structure. Um, I do think that we're influenced by Shakespeare and and, and it goes way back. And, And so we, for many generations, have the idea of a story in terms of you know, uh, whatever you call it, a three-act structure, a right. uh, start, the characters, uh, uh, some obstacle they have to face, you know, the, sure. the, the resolution and all these things that make up what we consider to be a story. Whereas I think the Asian tradition is much more used to the concept of a an epic voyage, a journey with different episodes along the way, hmm. which doesn't need to be so sort of instantly cathartic. It doesn't need to wrap itself up. Interesting, interesting. Um, you know, I think we used to have that in... Uh, I think at some point... Look, I don't know anything about this. I'm, I'm talking crap. But I think there was, in a way... In, in, in British literature, a sort of divergence the where it could have gone the way of sort of, you know, Pilgrim's Progress and instead it sort of went into a sort of more hmm. structured narrative format. So I wouldn't rule out that there might not be some fundamental uh, differences. Having said all of that, I think it is... Well, look, one must always, in any country or any language, be very, very wary of anybody who says, oh, that won't work. Because, of course, it never works until somebody makes it work. And then all those people will say, oh, oh, now it works. (laughs) Right, right, right. And there are so many stories. You know, the obvious one is, you know, Harry Potter being turned down by every publisher. There are so many stories of people who right. were rejected and rejected and rejected until somebody did it and then they Took proved that it worked. Right. And Hollywood studios are the worst at that, you know, at, at finding a formula and then, then grinding it out until it's dead. And, you know, you have memes that, oh, no, we don't make films about uh, racing cars. Two of them flopped. It doesn't work. Right, and then, right. of course, somebody will come and make one that's brilliant and then all those guys say, we want more racing car films. Right. So, uh, yes, when people say, oh, no, this, the Thai people won't like this, uh, they have no idea what they're talking about. Right, 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 right. And, and the truth is that they will like it 
if it's good, I think. Yeah, I, I, I kind of lean that way. Uh, one of the reasons I lean that way is, uh, you know, I teach an American film class at my university, and uh, my students love Hollywood films, and, and they're Thai. You know, so if there, if there was this great cultural, a true cultural divide in what types of stories they liked, their, their favorite films would, would all be Thai films. But the, m- most of my students, their favorite movies are Hollywood films. Well, of course, and I'm sure, you know, I should be asking you this question because you've done a much greater study on this. But I'm sure you find that there are hits and misses. I remember once taking um, a group of quite young Thais to the cinema and we eventually saw About Schmidt. Oh, right. I know the film. And this was a film which I really didn't... It seemed to be about, you know, American life, about a retiring man, about the waste of his days, about his coming to grips with what he'd done with his life. And it would be hard to think of a film that would be less likely to, to go across to a group of young Thai people. Right, right. And yet they found it charming and laughed and found it funny. Oh, that's great. So I think you find that it, uh, things that work and seem to transcend sometimes aren't the films you maybe expect. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, in my film class, uh, I mean, this is a little bit of a divergent topic, but it's what you said. In my film class, I've often been surprised at which American films mm. they relate to and which ones they don't. So I'm showing them movies that I think are great and I think they're going to love. And sometimes, like, just off the top of my head, like the movie, the movie Network, which I love, completely bombed. And it's like my students just could not comprehend why this guy was so angry and why he's yelling, like, I can't take it anymore. And it's got all kinds of crazy leftist politics in it. And they just totally didn't get it. Oh, but look. They totally didn't get it. I mean, we have to be careful, though, because my suspicion is that if you went to a group of 16, 17-year-old um, Americans or English students, <laughs> they may may not get it just as much. Maybe maybe that isn't us being expat or West. Maybe just we're old. <laughs> you're, <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, but, it, but it is kind of a fun, uh, yeah. almost lottery game to see uh, what movies they will like and what movies they won't like. Anyway, uh, I want to ask you about uh, your film club. So you started, uh, how, how many years now has it been? Because I was here, I think, I wasn't here immediately in the beginning, but I think I was here in the first year. I think it's about eight years now. It's yeah, a long so, time. That, that sounds about right. Um, and the, the, the club you started is called the Freeze Green Club. Um, and I know there's a story behind the name of the club. Well, it's named after a, a sort of forgotten pioneer of cinema, William Freese Green, who was an early British uh, inventor of different aspects of the film camera and film projection. And, okay. And he was an obsessive man, a man with a passion to make this happen. Um, one of the first people to ever see moving pictures um, was actually a policeman in London who saw this weird flickery light coming from an upstairs window and thought uh, something strange was going on, an explosive, and ran up and found free screen, who pulled him in and said, watch this. Ah, now, so he course, was experimenting with like with like an pro- early projector yes, or yes, something. Yes, exactly. And, and uh, different people, there was Pathé in France, there was Edison, of course, in America, and, and free screen, they were all, you know, nowadays uh, with inventions, it's all sort of on sort of sharing of information. But sure. back then there were different people working on different aspects sure. very much at the same time. Sure. And what I loved about him... <laughs> Um, was that, of course, he died in abject poverty and totally <laughs> forgotten <laughs> until, you know, historians started to look and realize that his uh, that he was truly one of the inventors of a number of aspects that uh, that went on to make up film. And so it seemed to me that that was a good sort of metaphor for what we wanted to do, which was to create a place that was about the joy of film, the exploration of film, this obsession. Uh, and and also we, we decided early on that this would not be, you know, a, a commercial money-making venture. And at that, we have succeeded extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> well, to explain to the audience, uh, the Free Green Club is um, uh, off of Sukumit Road on Soy 22. Um, and uh, it's essentially a converted shop house. Uh, and uh, on the first, uh, really, three floors, there are various uh, screens 
a small uh, movie theater uh, where uh, Paul shows films. And it's a, it's a private membership club, uh, but it is possible to uh, knock on the door and enter off the street and inquire as to how to become a member. Um, and the long and short of it is uh, you show films uh, t- typically six days a week. Is that correct? We, when when you were up and running? Yeah, I mean, for eight years we've shown, um, we're shut on Mondays. And the idea has always been we never show the same film twice in a year. Right. So, and it's a very sort of wide-ranging program, but the most important thing is it's nothing you would ever be able to see at your local uh, major cineplex or that's right, or that's SF right, cinema. So it's they're, they're old films or they're cult films or foreign films or arty films or we've really shown films from every country and every genre you can, Absolutely. You can imagine. Now a little uh, maybe a, a bit of a warning to listeners out there. I, I've been to some other bars or clubs that have a kind of movie theme. Uh, and when I go there, like I find that maybe there's some film being projected on the wall, like on the second floor, but ninety percent of it is just like a normal bar, and not many people are watching the film. But this is really a true film club, so people who come here genuinely enjoy watching movies. And of course, the, there may be some chit chat during the movie to a certain extent. It's not super formal, but the bottom line is we we sit down and actually watch the film, uh, you know, as if we're in a movie theater. I love it because it is a mix of a club. It is a club, but it's not a theater. And of course, you can order drinks and snacks and maybe order in some pizza. Um, but it really is for movie lovers. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So exactly. if you if you want to watch a movie uh, mm. and then maybe talk about it afterwards, uh, this is the best place uh, in Thailand, I think. Thank you. All right. Well. Paul, I wanted to thank you for coming on the Bangkok podcast. I feel like you would make an excellent guest in the future. I really would love to talk in detail about some of your movies, so maybe we'll save that for next time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Paul. That was great, man. And you know, something I love about about guys like Paul is that they are they live and breathe film, right? Like they are all sure. about it. Like it's easy to say, oh, I'm a film director or oh, I'm an actor or oh, I'm an editor or something. But I mean, he edits, he directs, he he writes. He, he composes, yeah, he, you're right. He posts, he's a judge. He, you know, he's he represents Thailand to the world in certain films. In, uh, in, in some ways, capacities, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's right, so, yeah. Uh, he's at the, right, he's at the Cannes Film Festival right now. Uh, you know, w- part of the Thai contingent there. Um, yeah, it's amazing. He's just good at wearing a lot of hats because he's he's got his acting thing, his directing thing, his writing thing. He's promoting right. film uh, in general uh, to the world, but also then having his own like little film club. Yeah, so he's a film guy through and through and uh, very accessible, very easy to talk to. Um, uh, even though he's had some pretty amazing film experiences, he's still down to earth. You know, it's like he's there's nothing snobbish about him. Uh, right. I would say he's uh, he's up there. You know, it, you know. There's certain names that you tend to hear a lot as, as like kind of senior expats. But then there's low key guys who are under the radar, and they're not really promoting themselves. But they are good examples of 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 amazing expats doing really cool stuff in Thailand. Yeah, right. And um, you know, I'm also a little bit jealous of him because I went to film school. And I don't work in the industry anymore, but it is a really, really hard industry to excel at and even to remain in for more than a couple of years because it's it's very cutthroat. It's very dog eat dog. Um, so to, to be in it this long with this, like you said, to wearing as many hats as he does is is a testament to his talent. So uh, it's really for great sure. To, to, to and, you know, as we said in the interview, uh, he's really made a conscious choice to just make the films he wants to make. I mean, of course, limited by his budget. But uh, he he definitely could have gone a much more commercial route or found a, found a well known production company or or, or whatever. And he's right. kind of just he's doing his own thing, you know. Really, there's you know again as we said in the interview, that there's there's really basically no foreigners here who are making movies in Thai language. I mean, there's I mean I'm sure there's a few examples, but uh, you know, so he's he's really just chosen a niche that works for him. And he's just going to run with it. And uh, I'm I just I'm a huge fan and support him 100 percent and and his projects. And uh, we will right. have him back. We will have him back. I guarantee it. That's cool. I always like hearing stories about how people came here and then sort of 
you know, eked out, they like carved out their little niche for themselves and accepted. That's right, and and, do, and and they're doing cool shit. You know, it's not you know, it, you're just yeah. like it's a, it, it's really whatever. You know, what, you know, I, I know he's always stressed out. He's got all these projects, and as you said, <laughs> no, 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 as you said, the you know the industry is competitive, and so I don't think his path is like some easy one where he's just made a billion dollars and he's just kicked back. It's not like that, but he's just doing fascinating interesting different stuff uh that uh, i'm jealous of <laughs> what, what else can right. i say well, many, many thanks to paul for coming on the show and uh yeah if you uh he if will you like be film back. check out check out his movies because they're very entertaining and very well made and yeah he will be back for sure famous line from another movie all right let's get into some love loathe or live with where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in bangkok which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here loathe about living here or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it the last time i asked ed what he thought about the old traditional thai brooms versus modern brooms and a little aside here, man, I didn't know that it would touch a nerve, but we got a lot of comments on this. <laughs> we did get a lot of comments, and I'd like to point out that I think everyone agreed with me. Yeah, I, I like the old the old school Thai brooms. I think they work oh my well in a condo. Um, but I, we got comments on Discord. We got comments on Twitter, and I, <laughs> I want to read this. I want to read this message that that our buddy Omar sent in on Patreon. He said, "Greg." I'm a fan, but I need you to explain yourself regarding those traditional brooms. You can see those brooms here in Japan, too, and I don't know how anybody could prefer them. I re-listened to the <laughs> podcast because I had to make sure that I wasn't missing something. The only defense of those brooms that I heard was, they don't last that long, and they just work better. They do? I need to see the data on that, please. Please tell Ed he's 100% correct. I don't understand why anybody who's seen our modern society would still choose a broom that's best suited to the 1700s. Love the show. <laughs> Well, dude, there's an intelligent guy. Uh, he's 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 one hundred percent he's one hundred percent correct. Just like he says, I'm one hundred percent correct. There's something about Thailand that, that Thailand just hasn't figured out the broom yet. It's like their their brooms are inferior. I'm just gonna we, we like to keep it straight here on the Bangkok podcast. And uh, Thai brooms, not a fan. Maybe we could add them to the to the des Thai desserts that haven't quite cracked. Yeah, I agree. You get it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's what we talked about last week. So this week, Ed, it's all over to you. All right. Once again, I have an idea that uh, you can't possibly love. So the question really is, <laughs> is, is this is this something that actually bothers you or you're just like, whatever? So okay. I mentioned uh, in the bonus show today that I was at the graduation uh, uh, kind of celebration at my university today. Total, yeah. scene of, total scene of chaos, but with a whole bunch of vendors selling different stuff like water coconut water water and one thing that was really popular is the orange drink and it's i think it's meant to be presented as maybe it's orange juice or you know and, and sometimes they even have like a person out there like squeezing a, a tangerine or something but right. inver invariably it's literally sugar water with orange food coloring you're talking about the stuff that they they put in bot like little bottles, yeah. little yeah. transparent yeah. bottles. Yeah. Now I'm sure some of it is real juice, and but in terms of the presentation, they never seem to make clear. You know, it always kind of looks like orange juice, but you never know. Are they really claim? Is this some like orange beverage? Right. Or right. It's tang, and, tang or something like that. Right. Right. And um, and invariably, I I when I pay the money, I'm hoping that I'm going to get juice. But then when it when it hits your mouth, you're like, oh shit, this is just sugar. This is sugar water, pure with sugar like, water. Yeah, well, with this, like orange this is food coloring. Good. It's like it's like this is orange water <laughs> with, with with some sugar in it. And you know, it, today in the heat, I was talking to a friend, and I was like, you know, it's so damn hot. I don't really care that this is has nothing to do with real oranges. I don't really care that there's right. nothing natural in here because it's just it's just cold. <laughs> yeah, right. But I don't. It, it's, <laughs> I, I'm going to reveal this is a pet peeve of mine that. You get this orange stuff on the street that looks like juice, but you never really know exactly what it is. Well, this is a good one because I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, there was a little bit of a controversy about this because someone recorded a video of some vendor somewhere who had like a hose hooked up to the Bangkok water supply on the sidewalk. <laughs> and they were quietly filling up bottles with like half water, half orange juice. Right, so right, right. Well, I, I'm, I'm I think always there was... a little bit suspicious. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and it, usually they don't even have a sign explaining what it is. So so for me, if they had a sign that said, um, and the sign said, orange drink, 
Well, to me, in, in English, orange drink means, okay, this is just going to be some fake crap. You know, if something says orange juice, then you know it's supposed to be more natural. But I feel in Thailand, it's up to you. I mean, of course, you can ask, but I, I, it's just one of my pet peeves, this, this thing that it's something that looks like juice, and it probably is not. It's funny, because when I see the phrase orange drink, the only thing I can think of is that Simpsons episode where Homer says, purple's a flavor. You know, like, <laughs> it, it kind of is, but not really. Right. So, but this is interesting, because I, I kind of... I, I kind of think of this stuff as like the equivalent of of, of Cinnabon, you know? Oh, like, I see. Okay. It looks good, and then you eat it or drink it, and you're like, oh, that tastes really good. And then afterwards, you're just like, I could have done without that. That was well, just, just like it's pure sugar. sugar. That's one of, yeah. yeah. No, Cinnabon is the same way. It looks great, and it tastes great. But within seconds, you realize it's 90% sugar. It's like, and yeah, it, it throws some, like, it's like I, sugar. It's like 90% sugar <laughs> and a little cinnamon. <laughs> yeah. That's like, what it is. And then, yeah, so I, I, I live with it. And you're right. It's good in a pinch. But it, I, it, you I'm never little, drink one and go, that was refreshing. I'm little, and I'm glad I had one. Shitty orange drink on the side of the road. I loathe you. Loathe, right? <laughs> okay. I'm going I'm to I'm live with because I'll, I'll drink it in a pinch, but I don't seek it out. So I'm going to live <laughs> with right. this one. Okay, a final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, baby. And you can listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show, or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take care of yourself out there. Stay safe and stay cool. And we'll see you back here next week. For sure. could start the show so let me focus here dude focus. this